And now I'm very excited to welcome back an amazing horse capper in Mr. Patrick Gates from the oddsbreakers.com. You can follow Patrick on Twitter at, at Gator Betting. Well, here we are, Patrick. The third leg of the Triple Crown is finally here. Feels a little earlier this year. How are you doing, Does. bud? Good, good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, whenever you kind of you wait all year for the Triple Crown to start here with the Derby, and then it seems like it just kind of flies by from there. It's crazy. We've already kind of reached the start of the uh, the, the last leg of the Triple Crown, but it's exciting. It means Saratoga. Obviously, it's going to be held there this year, and there's really no better place in the summer than uh, kind of spending a weekend at the spa. That's right. And so it is like you just alluded to a little bit different this year. Um, and yeah, it's June 5th and we're talking about, I kind of just remember like the Belmont, like mid June, maybe a little bit more yeah. towards the end. And here we are. It's because it just all happened to start early this year, but Hey man. Um, yeah. And I was just going to ask you what's different about the Belmont stakes. You can talk about the different course and why, and uh, anything else that's coming up? Yeah, so the Belmont, obviously, uh, is traditionally run at Belmont Park, another New York uh, racing course. But this year, it moves to Saratoga. Saratoga has, I don't believe, hosted this before here. But along with the venue change, there's a distance change as well. It's traditionally run at a mile and a half. But this year, it'll be run at a mile and a quarter, obviously impacting some horses more than other, which we can touch on later. But yeah, I mean, it's it should be a great. I think it's going to draw a pretty nice crowd here. Um, and I think it's going to be held here actually in 2025 as well with the renovations to Benmar or Belmont Park, excuse me, continuing. Yeah, so th th so hopefully it's done on time. Um, well, <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> you never know with these things. I, you know, I wonder if, uh, is it like mostly stands, uh, just nicer stands, maybe nicer uh, facilities and, uh, obviously, uh, maybe it's bigger. Yeah, Belmont Park was a pretty old course, so I think it's due for the renovation. Um, kind of out in your neck of the woods, Arlington Park is knocked down, and now they're putting up uh, apartments. So it seems <laughs> like they're trying to hold on to the few race courses that we have left here, uh, especially kind of some of the more prominent ones. Saratoga, uh, longstanding course as well in Saratoga Springs, gorgeous venue. Um, and I think it is a little bit bigger than Belmont here. So we should see a pretty good crowd this year. Yeah, we should. Uh, and so I'm excited for that. And a uh, bigger crowd, shorter race though. I always love Big Sandy though. You know, it's like a little different coming into it. And yeah. but let's face it, Patrick, this has been a different kind of a horse racing year. Um, some unexpected stuff happening. Uh, I, maybe I'm just sour because I didn't win the Kentucky Derby or the Prince. Maybe maybe that's yeah. it, man. I, I don't know. But uh, one thing that seems kind of consistent is we're talking about the weather. What's going on this weekend? Yeah. So unlike the first two legs of the Triple Crown, I think we're going to see some pretty ideal conditions here. It should be a fast track at Saratoga. There is some rain slated for Thursday, but I don't think that'll impact the races come Saturday. Should be clear all day Friday. And Saturday looks to be ideal racing conditions. So should be should be a great kind of race as well with the weather kind of you can take that out of your handicapping process. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. And this is in New York, right? Saratoga Springs. Correct. Yeah. I see I see some showers, but I don't even know what that means because it's less than 50%. So I think yeah. you just gotta wait. But you know, what's interesting about the Derby that it, it showed on the PPPs that it was a fast track. I'm not so sure about that. I, I you know, the pre this was definitely muddy, but what was the Kentucky Derby really that fast of a track? Yeah, I don't think so at all. Uh, I know we kind of touched on this when we talked about the Preakness and you kind of looked at the past performances and you saw Mystic Dan's, uh, the weather conditions for that Derby and you said fast. And I don't know if I'd classify it as fast by any means, maybe good, um, but not fast. Um, I think we'll see kind of true fast conditions come Saturday. Right. Absolutely. And this is only Wednesday, but, you know, we're getting on a little bit early here. Uh, why don't you give me some history about the, the Belmont then? Um, obviously, is this the first time it's been on a different course? Uh, what's so significant about this race? Yeah, so the Belmont's been held in New York, I think, since its uh, first edition back in 1867. Uh, it was held at another course. I can't think of the name of it, but it was in the Bronx. In 1905, it was moved over to Belmont Park. It's been held um, or it's had a few years that it hasn't been run due to kind of anti-gambling legislations back in the early 1900s. And also, um, I know we mentioned the change before, 
going from a mile and a half to a mile and a quarter here. And it has been run at that distance before, kind of in the late 1800s and early 1900s there. I mean, the Secretariat's victory here is kind of what the Belmont's most known for, that 31 length victory, which kind of still stands as the largest margin here and still stands as the fastest time for a mile and a half. So while it is kind of, I guess, maybe not perceived to be um, as kind of notable as the Derby, it is the oldest of the Triple Crown races. So it does have that over uh, over the Derby. Yeah, it is the oldest. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, Big Sandy not there because it's not Big Sandy. But here we are. We're in Saratona. But it's a mile and a quarter this year. So yep. that's definitely different. Is the post positions very important here uh, in this kind of race uh, at Saratoga? Or is it maybe something not as significant as like the Derby? Yeah, so you see kind of in the Derby that the post positions really matter more, kind of given that 20-plus uh, horse field sometimes. We only have 10 in this race um, going off Saturday, and the number one post position has actually won the most times, just under 19% since the uh, beginning here. Other notable positions that have had success is that two and three slot, as well as the five slot, I believe. So you're kind of looking to be along the rail here, Um we can get on it. We can touch on it a little bit later, actually. But the uh, kind of the race style for the Belmont has traditionally favored those front runners and those guys who kind of close up near the uh, the front of the pace. So, oh, so so even with the long distance in the Belmont, it's favored the front runners. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You'd almost think that the increase in distance would give these closers more time. Um, but that hasn't really kind of been the case. There's a stat. I think I have it. Yeah, right here. That twelve of the last um, twelve of the last fifteen winners kind of were in uh, four and a half lengths of the half mile pole. So you're going to kind of want to be in the front of the pace there, or kind of just off the uh, the front runners. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's that that's surprising, and that's great information. Thank you. Uh, and now you have a shorter race, so we'll see. Uh, who is going to be the front runners in this race? I should ask then. Yeah, so I'm looking at two of the front runners right now. Sees the gray. Obviously, we saw him go off in the Preakness, kind of going more towards the start. So he'll kind of want to do that same path as well. Resilience shouldn't give him too much uh, kind of uh, like pushback per se. Sorry, couldn't think of the word right there. Pushback on him getting out to the lead. Another horse that's going to want to go up to the lead here is going to be the number six, Doorknock. Doorknock hasn't had two uh, his last two races haven't been fantastic by any means. He hasn't been able to kind of get out to the front like he's wanted to. And we last saw his win come back in the Fountain of Youth Stakes where he was able to get out to the front of the pace. So I think Louis Size is going to kind of want to uh, embrace that strategy that's found him success in the past and move to the front. The only other horse that I could see kind of going out to the front here too is the 10 mind frame. And again, Sierra Leone and that nine slot is going to drop back uh, once that gate opens, so he should have kind of a clear shot to the front of the pack as well. Only racing twice, uh, he has shown that he does like to be kind of out near the front. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, early presser possibly for mind frame. And that's and that's an interesting horse because very li lightly raced here, it looks like, coming into the Derby, which, yep. uh, you know, I guess that kind of leads me into the next question here. I mean, how are the speed figures looking in, in this race compared to other Belmonts? And I see Mindframe's got some pretty good ones himself. Yes, yeah, so we only have three horses here who have reached uh, a triple-digit buyer. We have Seize the Gray and the Preakness. Mystic Dan has done it twice and is the only horse to do so, uh, recording a 100 and 101 in the Derby and the Southwest Stakes. And then Mindframe, too, in his broke, when he broke his maiden uh, at Gulfstream Park. He posted a 103 buyer. So you do have some speed in the races and sees the grand mind frame are kind of those front runners here. So that race does set up nicely for them as well. But Mystic Dan kind of just off the pack um, shouldn't have too bad of a trip here either. So it should be a pretty fast to moderate pace here. I'm guessing I don't think it's going to be overly fast uh, like we've seen kind of at the Preakness. But um, there's definitely going to be some early speed here. Gotcha. There you go. So we're going to have some early speed and uh, Sierra Leone is going to be one of the few closers in this race. It looks like uh, uh, Sierra Leone and Ana Marie. It looks like they're listed more of the uh, ones that should lay off the pace a little bit and kind of come from behind. Do you agree with that? 
Yeah, I would agree. I think Sierra Leone is kind of the main closer in this one. On Marie, uh, I could see kind of more towards the middle to the back of the pack. I don't think he's going to take kind of a similar trip to Sierra Leone where it really hangs off the pace. But if you look at that last one, uh, his race two in the Derby, he just got a terrible start here. Um, and before you look at his first few races, kind of middle of the pack. So I don't think he'll be as far back come kind of the quarter half mile pole as Sierra Leone. But he certainly won't be up there contending uh, out of the gate. Okay. Okay. Good information. So leading to my next question, who are you tossing off your card in this 10 horse race? Hopefully they all stick, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a tough one too, because I think everyone's live when it comes to kind of that third or fourth position, if you're playing some exotics here, but two of the horses that I don't think are serious win contenders in this race are going to be the number four wine steward and the number seven protective they have the largest odds so i guess it's easy to say oh you can just toss them but i don't think the wine steward um really has the speed to compete here in his last race the peter pan which is traditionally kind of correlates to, to success in the belmont uh raced well but lost to antiquarian who is that fifth horse in the belmont so i like that uh horse a little bit more than the wine steward and then protective as well just well, his speed figures have improved in his last two races. I don't think he's shown enough uh, to really compete in this race, given the uh, quality of the field. Okay, okay. So there you go with your ones you're tossing. Uh, how, I mean, is this field as good as other Belmonts, or is it a little bit below average? Uh, I think it's kind of on par. Um I mean, we've seen kind of following the Derby, uh, the fall off and just the quantity of horses, especially the Preakness and Belmont moving forward. I think we kind of got a larger field uh, this year in the Belmont than we would have given the decrease in distance from that mile and a half. But it's not a bad field. We have the Derby winner. We have the Preakness winner. We have multiple other horses who have won graded stakes. We have this uh, exciting horse in mind frame who's only raised twice, but is kind of shown the possibility of really putting on an impressive performance here and kind of staking that claim of uh, the best three-year-old. So it's a great field. There's plenty of storylines that you can go with. Um, so yeah, in terms of overall grade of the field, maybe an eight out of 10, nine out of 10. So it's okay. uh, should be a pretty good race. You're pretty high on that. And you know, a lot of horse betting since you bet a lot of horses. And <laughs> I guess the more novice guy would say, no, there's no triple crown guy. It's this, field sucks <laughs> you know? yeah yeah I, I, I definitely understand that argument too obviously you could uh, kind of would have liked mystic dan um to win the preakness but that uh the second place finish isn't going to get it done yeah I, I don't know when we'll see the next triple crown winner i really don't i have a feeling it could be a few years it's just such a tough schedule especially grueling if it does go back to that mile and a half which i'm expecting it will in a few years it's so tough, especially for these horses with the uh, the limited layoffs. I mean, some of them have run back to back in two weeks, but then after that, they'll take a three to four month layoff. So, and unfortunately, when you're in the Triple Crown, you don't have that luxury. It'll maybe be a month layoff between the uh, Preakness and Belmont. Yeah, that's very true. Um, you know, looking at the 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 new horse mind frame you know it, it's interesting you see him at seven to two and you wonder why he's the second favorite here in this race and then i kind of look at you know some of the things that the pps are showing us well for one you know his obviously mind-blowing 106 buyers or whatever it was it was uh 106 brisnet and it was 103 buyers and that's just a great number and then he won his next race you know and obviously this was uh uh, back in not, not even that long ago, May 24th, you know, and uh, he I, I didn't yeah. see how many links he won by. I have to go look at that again. But uh, it was, uh, you know, he hasn't lost yet. And then he's got tap it. You know, there's some tap it in him, his sire, you know. So that makes me, you know, that that's a great longer race type genetics, is he not? Yeah, no, I, I certainly think his pedigree plays a role here. And you look at his first race, like you said, where he broke his maiden, a seven furlong sprint at Gulfstream, where he won by 13 lengths, just put on an incredible performance. Uh, from there, they moved him up to a mile and a 16th, I believe, mile and an eighth uh, in an allowance optional claimer at Churchill Downs, where he won by over seven lengths. Seven and so, a half, yeah. Yeah, both of his races have been extremely important here. And then you look at the combination of Irad Ortiz, who's been arguably the best jockey across any racetrack in the past five years, and Todd Pletcher, who's had a ton of success in this race. So 
that kind of just adds to his uh, probability of winning here. And yeah, I, I do like this 10 over the nine um, Sierra Leone. We could talk okay. on it, but I, it's interesting too, because I, I think there's arguments that can be made either way for Sierra Leone in this deep closing role of, okay, we now shorten it from a mile and a half to a mile and a fourth that limits that half mile closing ability um, that he would have had to kind of catch up to the leader, come down the backstretch, or it's given the mile and a quarter distance, the pace is going to pick up, allowing him to set up even better uh, to close kind of in the backstretch. So there's two different mindsets I think people have with this horse. Mine's going to be the first of, I think this short, the shorting, the shortening of the uh, distance is really going to hurt him here. I think he's going to hit the board for sure, but I have a few other horses that I like up top um, in that one spot over him. I think Sierra Leone, I'm going to kind of slat, slate in that two to three um, position where he does, he's able to close, but I don't think he catches one of the front runners. Okay. Well, there you go. Let's talk about it. Who's, who do you like up top? And then uh, maybe give me one of the favorites and one of the long shots that you like. Yeah. So like I, I like I just said, my, my favorite in this one's going to be the 10 mind frame um, okay. limited okay. races, only two, but just shown an impressive ability. Um, has not raced against kind of the classes of horses that we're going to see in those Belmont, but given his first two races, I think he's kind of able to uh, withstand that. He's got familiarity uh, in the jockey. I read Ortiz and Pletcher knows what it takes to get it done in this race. So if I'm picking hit between him and Sierra Leone, I'm going with the 10 mind frame in terms of a few long shots here. I have two actually. So I have the number five antiquarian, um, only four starts to his name, but he broke his maiden in his second outing on a sloppy surface at fairgrounds. He uh, he suffered a setback in the Louisiana Derby where he actually broke through the starting gate before the race, but was still able to uh, kind of stay in contention. I think he finished fourth in that one. Uh, and then you look at his most recent outing after the Louisiana Derby. He won the Peter Pan, which we've seen several winners of the Belmont kind of come from that race before. He put on an impressive performance, winning by just under a length, despite being bumped at the start. So I like the five here. His workouts have been good as well. Heading into this race, another Todd Pletcher horse here. And then you got Johnny V, who's one of the most uh, veteran jockeys in this field. And then my other long shot is going to be actually Doorknock. So mm. Doorknock, last race in the Derby, didn't get a good start at all. Didn't start, didn't get a good start at all, excuse me. Uh, kind of shuffled out of the gate there. But you look at his races before that, he finished fourth in the Bluegrass Stakes. Um, not a great race for him. And then before that, he won the Fountain of Youth in the Resmen. But like we mentioned before, both of his last two races, he didn't get the ideal trip he wanted by any means. He was kind of held out of the gate, um, wasn't able to get out to the front of the pace here. I think Luis Saez puts an extreme emphasis on that uh, heading into this race. So I think he's going to push him up front. And he should have a chance here if he's able to kind of get that start. But like we said, the last two races, he hasn't been able to. So at 15 to one, I'm kind of willing to take a chance on this horse. Um, and he's shown he has kind of the speed that can compete here. He beats Sierra Leone back in that uh, Remsen stakes. So mm -hmm. which was a mile and an eighth too. Yep. He's done it before. So I, uh, I don't mind those two of antiquarian and door knock as a uh, long shot plays here. You make a good point, you know, and I mean, the way I looked at it is just like, I feel that Sierra Leone should have won the Derby. Um, yep. You know, you had the fighting between him and the Japanese horse. and Forever then, Young. Yes, that back and forth. And you had the best trip of all time from, uh, obviously, Mystic Dan on a wetter track. And, you know, Mystic Dan's a good slopper. And uh, I, I, I watched the pre I rewatched the Preakness before you came on about 20 minutes ago, half hour ago. And Mystic Dan was faltering at the end of that. And that's a mile and an eighth. You know, I feel like even though it's just a mile and a quarter, he would need another perfect trip to win this thing. So I almost kind of, I'm almost more of a fade person on Mystic Dan. I think he's already had his, uh, his time in the, uh, obviously in the, in, in the number one. And I think I, I, I just, the problem is I'm like, I'm sitting here liking the horse that's got nine to five odds. You know, it's like less than two yep. and one right now. And I don't know what's going to happen when 
uh, on race day, I think it probably stays pretty close to that. Maybe you get two to one, but I do like Flavian Pratt a lot. Um, I, I almost feel like the way I have to play it is almost like take him and uh, if I have to put him with mind frame, that's all in betting type situation. And, you know, it's almost like it's, it's not going to pay well at all. It's a terrible exact on that. It's almost like an exact the box might not even pay right on that, you know? It's yeah. so bad. It's uh and I did I mean, like mind frame some. I just don't like mind frame's price. Yeah. I mean, at that rate, you'd almost do a 10-9 over the 10-9 and then kind of just build a super out of it to try to get some value of those long shots coming in maybe third or fourth if you do a try uh or a super just to add some value. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards uh backing mind frame. So uh mm -hmm. that's just my thought process here, but yeah, what about, I don't, what about the one horse too? And sorry if I interrupted you. No, 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 no. So I mean, Mystic Dan's also the only horse that has raced in the first two legs of the Triple Crown here. Um, so there's an argument to be made of he's finished first and second in the Derby and the uh, Preakness, and kind of just hang him up and just you can just his stud fee is going to pay for another 200 horses for this uh, right. the owner. But yeah, I guess they're going to kind of give him one last go here. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen to him after that. Maybe we see him in the Travers later on this summer. So who knows? I The one horse I am disappointed in uh, not competing in this was uh, Torpedo Anna. We talked about her in the Kentucky Oaks. She ended up winning that. There was a rumor that she was going to be in the field here. And I don't, we haven't seen a Philly kind of win this uh, in the last few years, but that would have been fun to add to the uh, storylines this week. And yeah, Seize the Gray is another interesting one. We haven't seen too many winners come from the Preakness, given kind of that short layoff time. Impressive. But he's in the one hole. He is yeah, in the one hole. He is in the one Yeah. I know. I, I just, I don't love the horse, especially kind of given the, uh, the layoff here. I'm trying to find something. I read something about this uh, of horses who came from the Preakness. Yeah. So only three Preakness alumni from the past 20 years have come back to win the Belmont. Notably, all three of those horses who did win uh, coming from the Preakness to the Belmont were the winners. So he did win the Preakness. I guess he could be kind of in line with that statistic. But like I mentioned, only three of the past, uh, yeah, only three Preakness alumni from the past 20 years have uh, won the Belmont. So it hasn't been a great history. If it does set, it'll end up raining, you know, it, it, you want to go back to back. Mystic Dan. Yeah, you go back yeah. to those two. Yeah, Mystic Dan, you go back to Seize the Gray, too. And, and, yeah. and so it's just going to be interesting um, when we actually pull up the odds here. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I'm probably going to do what you said. I'm probably going to grab two horses and put them on top. And maybe at may, maybe I'll add a third for second. Um, and then just all button type situation and just, you know, hope it's not necessarily going to be one of those i break even or lose a little bit of money tickets because it goes sierra leone if i do go with mind frame it goes sierra leone mind frame even with an all button not going to pay a ton of money so um no. I, I have to decide but i'm kind of just I, i'm a little bit higher on Caesar gray than i am about mystic dan i think you have a good great argument i agree i i you have a great um argument for doorknock too how he did, did beat sierra leone back in uh december on a pretty long track you know obviously uh at the remsen so that's 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 something i'm going to think about as well so maybe i could pivot a little bit to a, a nice horse that's 15 to 1 you know and uh luis saez is, is a is a fantastic jockey isn't he yeah he really is and in terms of kind of where we think where i think personally these odds are going to go and it's it's such kind of a thing it's such a game to play with yourself of is the horse going to get bet down because its name, the jockey, or just kind of where the uh, the public money is coming in from? I think Sierra Leone does go off as the favorite um, around that nine to five range. I can see Mind Frame maybe sneaking in there as well, um, going down um, maybe even a little shorter to kind of three to one range, uh, dropping from that three and a half to three. The Wine Steward. I mean, I, it's just a fun name. I'm sure people will be on that horse uh, when they shouldn't be. So I'm guessing he'll go off around 12 to one mystic Dan and sees the gray will get bet down as well, given them they've won the Derby and Preakness. So that's kind of where I see uh, it moving. If you can bet fixed odds, I would do so on antiquarian and doorknock. Um, I know FanDuel offers that sometimes, but 
I don't think many other books do. I know DraftKings doesn't. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, Bet Online does, I know, for yeah. offshore. So it is, yeah, I, I think um, the big decision is going to be made when the weather comes in. But it sounds like I'm a little bit more on Seize the Gray. You're a little bit more of on uh, Door Knock and Antiquarian. But um, you, me and you both have agreement on Mindframe being pretty close to the top. And I think I like Sierra Leone a little bit more than you. So uh, how much do you think you're going to invest on your ticket? Yeah, so I kind of have it uh, all set now. So I have two $10 win bets on the five and the six here, which um, should pay out if they, uh, a decent rate if they stay double digit here. And then I got a $4 exact. So the first, uh, so the $10 win bet for two horses is going to cost 20 bucks. After that, I add a $4 exact. I'm going with 10 over the one, three, five, six, nine. So that's going to cost 20 bucks as well. So that's mind frame over seize the gray. Mystic Dan, Antiquarian, Doorknock, and then Sierra Leone. Obviously, I'm hoping Sierra Leone doesn't come in that slot right there um, to kind of get a better price. But I am kind of protecting myself if that does happen. And, you know, with these larger pools, especially in the Triple Crown days, you're going to get some money back more than you kind of traditionally would on just a random Thursday or Friday at Saratoga. Um, So you do have to factor that in. And I have a long shot Superfecta uh, as well. I talked about this race setting up where I think if Mindframe does win, Sierra Leone would be right behind him. So I have the 10 over the 9 over the 1, 3, 5, 6 over all. So that's Mindframe over Sierra Leone over Seize the Gray, Mystic Dan, Doorknock, Antiquarian over the all. And that's 28 bucks for a $1 super. So I have three tickets all kind of around that $20 range. Um yeah, that's kind of think I'm going to attack it here. Um, that's at least what I have on the board now. Who knows? As we get closer to race time and we see some things change, I'll probably add a few uh, tickets as well. Maybe you'll add a trifecta because you didn't discuss that. <laughs> yeah, I, like so. I think I would do the same thing as kind of that four dollar exacto, whereas I'd key I'd key a horse on top, whether it's that ten uh, mind frame, who I think of the two favorites, like I mentioned before, is the better horse. So I'd maybe do the ten over the one, three, five, six, nine, and then kind of just repeat that as well. I don't think the four and the seven are going to be in play in terms of that third spot. But maybe they'll get in there um, for the fourth position, which is why I put that all in the superfecta. And you're, I guess at that point, you're kind of just hoping they do come in, given their odds. Oh, nice. Absolutely. Well, when you make that decision, where could our listeners and viewers go for that information? Yeah, I should have my article posted later today on the oddsbreakers.com. Um, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And yeah, any other live plays, I will uh, post on my Twitter account. So stay tuned as well. Sounds like you're going to be watching from a different state. Yeah, yeah. A little bachelor party this weekend. So I, I don't know in terms of the live betting how that's going to impact that, but I'm sure it will <laughs> one way or the other. Um, so, yeah, if you see any uh, rogue rogue $100 tickets, uh, yeah, be sure to call me off on those. <laughs> yeah, make sure you be a little careful with, uh, with yeah, Patrick's exactly. state of mind. Uh, yeah, great I'm going to have to lock my FanDuel account. <laughs> hopefully it doesn't work from that state if it comes to that I, I so. yeah <laughs> well great stuff patrick make sure you guys check out patrick gates at gator betting it's been a pleasure we'll talk soon patrick awesome thanks for having me on